from the beginning of time. This has been Mankind's Dream. To explore the wonders of nature in all its magnificence. To experience the treasure of life with all its possibilities. To unravel the mysteries of time with all its promise. As the pace of life all around us quickens, science is on the verge of making mankind's dream of having more time a reality. A dream of harnessing time, capturing time, expanding time. Enough time to explore, to discover, to understand, to experience a long and fruitful life. The ancient Egyptians believed that their spirit in the afterlife could eat, play, and enjoy all the things they had on Earth. For 25 centuries, Tibetan monks harbored the secrets to remarkable rejuvenation in the Eye of Revelation. Polynesian tradition located their fountain of perpetual youth in Hawaii. More than 500 years ago, Ponce de Leon sought the fabled fountain of youth throughout the Americas. The promise of more time has fascinated man from the beginning, always beckoning. If we live 10 more years, that's good. If we live 20 more years, that's pretty good. 30 more years, oh, it's getting sketchy. 40, 50, okay. If you live 54 years, think of all the things that you could do within those 50 years. You could see your children graduating from college. You could see your children being married. And then you could see their children. You could see your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. More time for love. I want more time to have more of the same. And all the things, all the experiences, all the adventures, all the passions, all the intimacies, all the closenesses with family that I can't possibly get into a day, a week, a month, a year, a normal lifespan. More time to experience life to the fullest. Well, I want to enjoy life. I enjoy life now. I have no desire uh, to stop living. The family, the friends, and the quality of life uh, keeps uh, improving. Life becomes uh, a greater experience as we uh, grow older and uh, understand it better. More time to see what the future will bring. I would really love to get a chance to see the stars one day and, and maybe do some intergalactic travel instead of just uh, international travel. I think we have a tremendous instinct for survival. I think it was best stated, at least in printed word, the longest ago by Benjamin Franklin, who very clearly stated that he wished, instead of an ordinary death, to be placed in a cask of Madeira wine with some good friends to be revived by the warm sun of his country a hundred years hence. But he said, alas, I fear we are too close to the infancy of science to have that happen. Well, we're not 200 and some odd years later too close to the infancy. In fact, we are approaching uh, the nascency, uh, the nascence of this idea being very possible. So I think it's within human beings to want to know what might happen in the future. But it would be more than two centuries before science would catch up to Franklin's wish. In 1964, physics teacher Robert Edinger published The Prospect of Immortality, detailing the prospect of freezing a human until medical science advanced enough to restore the person to good health. Man's dream of suspending life was on the verge of reality, and it was called cryonics. Myself and a couple of others were involved with uh, cryogenics, uh, cryonic, cryogenics at the time, which is making uh, vehicles to store liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen, oxygen. And we had a uh, very uh, interesting experience uh, working with the NASA uh, S-4B Saturn upper stage that took the, put the Apollo astronauts on the moon by doing a lot of cryogenic testing with, with vessels and valves and this sort of thing. From that data, from that knowledge, we produced about a thousand cryo capsules a year. So we designed what we thought was the ultimate cryo capsule. It's super insulation, high vacuum, uh, access ports using the latest technology for sealing and with bellows for expansion and instrumentation. And we had it fabricated here in Phoenix. 
Just three short years after Edinger's book in January of 1967, Ted Craver and his colleagues got their chance to make history. About a year later is when we got the word from California that Dr. Bedford had died and uh, his, uh, his family wanted him frozen and uh, it was brought in, oh, I think about late afternoon and we had the capsule ready and uh, we started the procedure and we had, uh, it took until about three in the morning, three or four in the morning before we could finally uh, get Dr. Bedford, uh, who'd been pre-frozen, into the capsule, all the instrumentation hooked up and all the um, uh, insulation put around the, the head of it and then put the outer head on and then eventually started drawing a vacuum. And then we uh, uh, put the liquid nitrogen in and we could watch the temperature dropping very rapidly and it seemed to be pretty well frozen, deeply frozen by the, uh, by the next day. Even before Edinger's vision in the 1960s, science and technology were already extending our lifespans. Since Henry Ford introduced his first Model T, the average American lifespan has increased by 50%. In the early 1900s, no one dreamed of a cure for polio, let alone life-extending heart transplants, life-giving in vitro fertilization, or life-changing stem cell research. And with each new scientific and medical advancement, we understand more about the true nature of our biology the subtleties between life and death. What was considered dead 50 years ago is no longer valid today. CPR and defibrillators revive thousands of legally dead people each year effortlessly. Organ transplants and open heart surgery are routine and highly successful at bringing new life to the otherwise terminally ill patient. And we know from the miraculous stories of children who have been brought back to life after drowning in icy lakes or rivers, that cold staved off death. Well, people are beginning to reassess what they mean by death, and it's, it's long, this has long been overdue because we've known that you can preserve cells and even uh, organisms like tardigrade, a little water bear animal, for a hundred years without any metabolism at all. So. We know that metabolism, the machinery of life, doesn't have to be active for life to be there in some kind of form. So our usual definition of life, which is the metabolic processes and the chemistry and all those things, that's not really life. Life is the information with the ability to store cells in liquid nitrogen for as long as you want, which we do routinely now, and embryos, human embryos as well. Um, we should be thinking about the fact that life is, is the information and that it is potentially as permanent as you'd like it to be. So if death is not simply the moment when our heart stops, then when does it occur? We have this legal concept called clinical death, where one is pronounced dead, but there's no actual you know, black and white biological change that happens simultaneously with going from a state of being um, clinically dead, clinical life to clinical dead, or it really matters if your heart has stopped. And it's some time from then before um, things start going really wrong, especially if you get cooled down really quickly as soon as your heart has stopped. Um, so restoring someone who's been well cryopreserved to a uh, functional state, a biologically functional state, is simply a natural extension of restoring someone who is still alive but very frail and suffering advanced aspects of aging, whether it's cancer or atherosclerosis or whatever, again, then to a youthful state. It's not even just theoretically possible in the same way that um, traveling at half the speed of light is theoretically possible. It's a perfectly reasonable, natural extension of straightforward biotechnology. Trionics is the next logical step for significantly extending life. I think cryonics is going to one day possibly provide 